what's uh, traveling around Israel like for a fluent Hebrew speaker who um, is in one sense not a local, but in another sense really understands the locals to, I, I think, to a considerable extent. Well, Israelis have a very bizarre sense of privacy and personal space. And of course, what that means is they have very little sense of privacy and very little sense of personal space. And so if you like privacy and personal space, and if you are if you are easily offended by people just asking you extremely private questions uh, about where you're from and how much you earn and all this sort of stuff, uh, then Israel is probably not the place for you. Uh, or if you are very... Uh, sensitive about people invading your personal space and bumping into you and sitting close to you and when they talk to you putting their putting their hands on you then Israel is probably not the place for you but if those things don't bother you especially you and and you have a certain amount of uh, a certain capacity for understanding that you're really in a quite an alien culture from the Australian culture for example you will find that Israelis are really uh, engaging and vibrant people. They're very, very warm. They're very friendly. Um, and if you connect with an Israeli total stranger, you'll find that that person will be very, very generous um, in a way that goes beyond what you get in Melbourne. So in Melbourne, if, a, if, you, if a tourist is walking around the CBD with a map, there will be plenty of people who go up and say, hey, do you, you, know, do you need a hand? Uh, do you know where to go? Are you familiar with the area? Let me show you. you know. And so you would point that person in the right direction. But an Israeli will go further. An Israeli will, um, like if, you need, if you're on a bus and you need to get to a particular place and you really don't know your way around, then that, that person will, if that person knows, then that person will say, look, you come with me and I'll make sure you get there. And if that person doesn't know, then she might say, Okay, I don't know where to go. So, and then she'll just go around the bus and start asking people, "Do you know how to get to X? Do you know how to get X? Do you know how to get there?" And until that, until you know, half the bus has been notified of your destination, and uh, someone will sort of take over and say, "Okay, yeah, get off at my stop, and I'll I'll help you get to where you need to get to." Another example was I was in the post office uh, waiting to pick up a package for my grandparents, and I was chatting to. A woman who was there with her two daughters. You know, we had a nice little conversation, and uh, she had bought some falafel, and uh, she didn't. She had two falafel balls left. She wasn't going to eat them. Her daughters weren't going to eat them. So she's like, "Do you want some falafel?" Yeah, why not? I don't. I don't think that would ever happen in Melbourne. Sharing food in Israel is something that is so uh, so deeply embedded in the culture. I, mean, I, rem I remember from school, when I went to school here, people would say, Misho chelevad met levad, you know, he who eats alone dies alone, which can be interpreted in a number of ways. But for Israelis, there really is, there's something deeply personal about uh, sharing food, even with strangers. Now, of course, that's not unique to Israelis. And, I mean, people share food and people eat from shared platters and cultures all over the world. But uh, the... The manner in which Israelis thoughtlessly walk through barriers of personal space is both endearing and irritating. And I think it's a, it's a useful and educative task to see whether when you visit Israel, you can find a way to, to look at it in a positive light rather than be personally offended by it. This is something that Israelis uh, struggle with when they go overseas, especially because they find themselves thrust into an alien culture with, uh, with much, much stricter uh, rules of privacy and personal space. And they often struggle to adapt to these strictures. They feel quite constrained. And I, I've known a lot of Israelis who went to Australia and ostensibly had a better life in that they had better economic opportunities, but uh, ultimately decided to go back to Israel. Um, and I think to a considerable extent, because besides the fact that their family and friends are in Israel, they, they, just, don't, they just don't feel comfortable in the 
a very, very severely polite culture of a place like Australia. Now, it's funny, in, in, of course, in Australia, we assume that we're sort of very open and easygoing compared to the English. But the fact of the matter is that Australia is basically a police state. And culturally, there, there, are, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of rules about how to behave. There's so much part of the fabric of life that we don't pay attention to it. But you know, things like standing to the left on the escalator and, you know, a certain amount of personal space when you talk to someone and national religion of avoiding at all cost directly saying what it is you want to say, especially when it comes to criticism. Israelis don't have, don't have that at all. I mean, if an Israeli wants to say something, he just says it. In Australia, you'll say, I don't think so, or I don't really like it. And Israeli will say, I hate it. It's terrible. <laughs> and so you can just imagine that someone who is used to using very strong positive language, goes to a culture where the, the tendency is to speak in euphemism, circumlocution, use the double negative, I'm, or use the negative, I'm not so sure, I don't think it's likely, or I don't know, I'm not sure if it's appropriate. And uh, you can readily understand that it would be quite tricky.